Hey guys, so winter is coming. It should have been here like a month, two months ago. Every time I buy something to make my life easier during winter, winter doesn't come. The first year I bought a snowblower, it snowed once where I could actually use the thing. So this year I decided to buy a more efficient way to heat my tank, and last week it was 60 something degrees. It's ridiculous. Anyway, uh, so on the bench today we have heating large tanks with your existing gas hot water heater or boiler. And I know a lot of you are going to ask why would you want to do this? So let's go over some of the positives and negatives of a system like this. This kind of system only really makes sense if you live in a fairly cold climate with a tank that is at least 200 gallons. But if you match something like that, then this system could save you 40% on your energy costs, plus or minus 15% depending on how efficient your existing hot water heater is. So if we look at an example from my tank, I have a roughly 280 gallon tank and because I have an abnormally cold basement and I have a basement sump and a basement frag tank, it takes 1500 watts of heaters to keep my tank hot. Now, if I ran those 1500 watts of heaters 24 hours a day, we can make a rough approximation for anything, assuming t around 12 cents per kilowatt hour, that a watt run 24 seven is approximately a dollar every year. So this would cost me $1,500. Now, I don't run my heaters 24 seven all year round. I only run them, let's say, six months out of the year. So that cuts my costs in half to $750 a year. But I also don't run my heaters uh, all, all day and all night. I have a thousand watt metal halide system that takes over a significant chunk of the heating. So let's say that I only run them for 12 hours a day. So now I'm down to $375 for my yearly cost to heat my tank. Now, if we assume 40% savings, then that's a savings of around $150. So even on a smaller system like mine, uh, this, these savings can quickly add up. So the next benefit is this system is going to be safer than using electric heaters because you don't need to have uh, as many or any electrical heaters in your tank. For me, the electrical heater is the last 120 volt source of AC power that is in my tank. If I got rid of them, I would only have DC power within my tank, which would obviously be safer. We also don't have the cost associated with electrical heater purchase and replacement costs. My 1500 watts of heaters cost around $150 to $200. And depending on who you talk to, those heaters need to be replaced every two to three years. I don't think this applies to heaters with digital thermostats, but I'm not sure. And I also don't think a lot of people follow this rule. Um, I know I don't, but I probably should. We're also going to have the ability to heat larger tanks faster. A 40,000 BTU uh, gas water heater, which is kind of average for a house, is roughly the equivalent of a 12,000 watt heater. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean we're going to heat faster. The rate of heating also depends on how fast we circulate the hot water, as well as the tank water, as well as the size of the heat exchanger, as well as how hot you keep your water in your hot water heater. Next, and this is a big one, is reduced electrical load. If you have an older house that might only have a 100 amp service or older lines, this can be really important, especially if you already have higher demands. But we can also reduce the number of new lines needed to power larger tanks. So I know when I first installed my 280 gallon tank, I needed to install two new 20 amp breakers and lines and I'm sure that this cost me at least a hundred dollars in parts and I did all the work myself. If I had hired an electrician, I'm sure it would have cost at least five hundred dollars minimum. 
We also have the ability to heat our tank during a power outage. Both gas hot water heaters and furnaces can easily be run off portable generators, which allow you to heat both your home and your tank. If you try running a thousand watts of electric heaters off of a generator, it will work, but it's a lot of wear and tear on your generator, and you're probably going to have to wake up in the middle of the night to refill that gas tank. So this can be especially important in cold weather climates and rural areas that can expect to go without power every couple of years for a few days just due to winter storms. And I live in a city of one million people and just last year in some suburban areas around Rochester we had people without power in 10 degree Fahrenheit weather for up to two weeks and I know a fair number of people lost their entire tanks due to this just because they could not keep them warm even if they had a generator to run their electric heaters. Lastly, this system can easily be modified to use as a chiller, so no more expensive chillers that are constantly breaking. Uh, you can do this by either connecting up to your house's central air or slightly modifying a window AC unit. Now, like any system, there are some downsides. The main one to this one is that you're going to spend a little bit mo more money at first. Figure around three to four hundred dollars. This can be done cheaper, but it increases the possibility of other problems. But even so, with a borderline system like mine, uh, I can expect to pay off in two years. The system also requires some plumbing. Uh, the greater the distance between the sump and the tank, and the hot water heater, the more expensive and complex this becomes. It also is probably going to require some soldering, but soldering is easy, hard to screw up, and it's a life skill worth having, so I would definitely say you, that anyone can tackle this themselves. If you really don't want to solder, you can buy shark bite fittings. They're a little bit more expensive, but they do work very well, and I've never seen one leak. The system also requires a little bit more upkeep. If a electric hot water heater in your tank or sump uh, gets dirty, it's not a big deal, it'll still heat the water. If your heat exchanger gets dirty, it's going to exchange less heat and it's also going to reduce flow. So you have to clean your system a little bit more frequently. This is not a big deal. Uh, for me, it's probably going to be a twice a year sort of thing. Lastly, we're going to be putting a little bit more load on our gas hot water heater, which will obviously drive up our gas bill. But it'll also put a little bit more wear and tear on your hot water heater. Now your hot water heater is already on all the time, heating water. So I don't think this is going to be a large effect, but it could hypothetically shorten the lifespan of your hot water heater just a little bit. So there are some other concerns with heating your tank with your domestic hot water, but they all arise from poorly designed systems. The most common poorly designed system that I see, and this one is all over the internet, is running hot water from your hot water heater through a circulator pump, through a coil of PEX that sits in your sump, and then back to your hot water heater. The largest danger with that is that Legionella grows in pipes with temperatures below 113 degrees and kind of hot enough to promote bacteria growth. Obviously this danger is not too great, otherwise every time we left the hot water pipes stagnant we would have to flush or disinfect them before we drank out of them. Uh, and we don't have to do that. But PEX is a little bit more prone to bacterial growth than copper is, say, and we're letting a lot of water sit at the perfect breeding temperature for bacteria in the sump. So you can mitigate this slightly by flushing the PEX daily, but this is still going to be a concern and Legionella is very dangerous. It can actually lead to death. So not something we really want to be messing with. This is also a very bulky system. I don't know about you, but I don't really want 100 feet of PEX sitting in my sump. My sump is just not big enough. So that doesn't really work for me either. And lastly, this puts fresh water right into our sump. Now obviously it's contained within the PEX, but if the PEX breaks down or springs a leak, then we have fresh water being dumped directly into our sump, which is obviously going to be a really big problem. There is also some debate about how reef safe 
uh, some of the exteriors of this PEX piping is. So the method that I'm going to show you today is not the cheapest, but it is simple, safe, compact, and reliable. We're going to use our return pump to push water through a heat exchanger and then onto the display tank. Now we need a way to heat up this heat exchanger and we're going to be using uh, our domestic hot water heater. So we're going to tee off this hot water line and run a line to our heat exchanger through a circulating pump. This water is going to be pushed through our heat exchanger. Now we need to get the water back to the hot water heater. We could run this line back to the closest cold water pipe. The problem with this is, is I have this going to uh, the house and if this, if someone turns on the water, say upstairs, then it's going to draw hot water instead of cold water. So you're not going to have uh, cold water whenever you're heating your tank. So that's not really ideal. So let's avoid that. We'll turn this back to cold water. And we're going to instead run this line back to the cold water supply for our hot water heater. And that means that the house cold water and hot water never mix, which is what we want. So when we start using the hot water heat exchanger, this pump is going to turn on. It's going to push water through the heat exchanger, counter flowing it against the flow of water to the display and then onward back to the input of the hot water heater which then will circulate the water back out and back to the pump. So I'm going to go over the parts needed uh, to do this build and the two most expensive parts are the titanium heat exchanger and the circulating pump. Now, if you're running a salt water system, you have to have a titanium heat exchanger. If you're running a fresh water system, then you could get away with a stainless steel uh, heat exchanger, which are significantly cheaper. This titanium heat exchanger, I think cost me $160. And uh, it seems pretty well built. It's definitely Chinese made, but I checked it for leaks and it, it didn't have any and I think it'll work fine for my system. This is the circulator pump that I bought. It's uh, stainless steel and it's a Grund, Grundfos, I think that's how you say that. Um, but Taco also makes one that's uh, very similar. Um, it's meant to circulate water through uh, domestic pipes so that you don't have to have wait for hot water at your shower basically. Now, there are Chinese versions of this that you can buy for not uh, that much, um, but I would recommend one of the brand names because they typically go for pretty cheap on eBay and I think it's worth it. The other parts that you're going to need are going to vary depending on your installation, but I'm going to run you through what I'm going to use because I think it's a pretty good example. I have one and a half inch return lines uh, from my sump to my tank. So I bought three one and a half inch uh, unions. You also need two uh, 90 degree bends, two uh, reducing bushings to get to uh, one inch threaded because all the heat exchangers use one inch uh, inlets. You'll need two one inch nipples. And that's it for the PVC side of things. Moving on to the copper, you're going to need a length of three quarter inch copper piping. You'll also need a way to get from what your house probably is, which is half inch to three quarter inch. Uh, they do sell uh, T fittings that do that directly, but I couldn't find them. So I'm just going to use some adapter fittings. You will need four braised to threaded adapters, three quarter inch. Uh, the the input lines on the on the heat exchanger, at least the one that I bought, are three quarter inch. 
you'll need a three quarter inch ball uh, valve, which I don't have shown here because it's actually already on the pipe. Um, I'm using an extra three quarter inch ball valve, but that's not needed. I'm also using a one way valve, but that's also not needed. I just had this stuff lying around. Um, and then you'll also need as the way to control this system, a motorized ball valve. Uh, and this is a three quarter inch uh, motorized ball valve. And then lastly, you'll need a few uh, brass nipples to connect all this stuff together. All right, I nearly forgot. You're also going to need at least two uh, unions, three quarter inch unions. These are copper, which I'm going to try to use just because they're significantly cheaper than their brass counterparts. I've heard bad things about copper unions that they're hard to get to seal. I'm hoping that I can solve that with the old plumber's trick of putting some thread dope uh, around the seal since they, they use a pressure seal. This, this surface against this surface is the seal. So I'm hoping these work. You're going to need at least two of them to be able to drain and remove uh, your system and you might need more. All right, so these are the tools that we're going to need to complete this project. Uh, we're going to need for the PVC part, obviously a way to cut the PVC, but also uh, your primer and your glue. Uh, for the copper side of things, you're going to need a way to cut both half inch and three quarter inch uh, tubing. So I have a half inch and three quarter inch uh, pipe cutter. And then a way to clean up those pipes. Um, which is not, this is not absolutely necessary, but this is a, just a pipe brush. And I always like to pre-sand uh, my pipe with a little bit of emery cloth just to make it easier on myself. Uh, some thread dope for the uh, copper unions. And some thread tape for the, uh, for the nipples. And then if you're going to be doing it with solder, which I'm going to assume that you are, you'll need a torch. Uh, this one is MAP and it's what I would recommend because the temperature is much hotter so it'll go faster. Um, but you can just, just use a propane torch. If you're going to be uh, soldering up against wood, it's helpful to have one of these soldering mats. You can just tack this up against the wood and you can put your flame up against it and it protects the wood from burning. So a good way not to start fires. Then you'll obviously need uh, your solder and your flux and hopefully a flux brush. Alright, so I'm going to be doing the PVC part of this first. So the water is going to be flowing in from here into the heat exchanger, along the heat exchanger and out. But I want to be able to remove this. So I have three unions. So two unions are going to go to this, but then I want to orient them in, the, in a way so that uh, this ring is on this side both times so that I can take another union and split it in half and use that so I can install just a straight pipe uh, if I ever need to take this out. But obviously I still need to run my return pipe. So I've got that. I have also pre-cut a few uh, little scrap pieces of PVC uh, to glue all this together. Uh, I have some thread tape. Uh, I know people say not to use thread tape and instead to use thread sealant, but I use thread tape on the PVC. Uh, so now we just have to put it together. All right, so now that I've completely gassed myself out of the completely non-ventilated basement. Uh, I'm going to cut the piece that is going to be my straight pipe and uh, make it while I have it on the bench. All right, I got my piece cut. Hopefully it's the right size. Don't forget to put your uh, union ring on the piece. Let's glue it up. Alright, now we just need to uh, cut a section out of our return pipe 
glue these two union pieces in and attach uh, this together. All right, so at this point I have the entire system dry fitted. So it starts off with teeing off of a hot water line. You can tell that this is the hot water line because it's not tarnished. The cold water line condenses uh, humidity in the air and it will tarnish. This is the gas line, which I can tell you, if you're soldering right next to a gas line, uh, you're going to have your backside puckered a little bit. Uh, but nothing exploded, so I guess we're all good. So we go off of the half inch copper, and I'm sorry it's such a mess and so cramped down here. I actually rent, I'm a graduate student, so even this is pushing a little bit of my boundaries on what I'm allowed to do. So anyway, we go off the hot water line, and then from there we go to a shutoff valve, and then to our circulation pump. Let's see here. And then from the circulation pump we go to the uh, unnecessary uh, backflow preventer, and then to our uh, electronic solenoid valve. I'm not 100% sure if this solenoid valve is required for this. I w put it in because I was worried that water would flow through the system and heat the tank when I didn't want to, uh, just through some uh, thermal siphoning. So I put it in even though we're going to have the pump decide when to actually circulate water. Um, but I wanted to prevent any water from circulating uh, when I didn't want it uh, circulating, so I put in the solenoid valve. Then we go over to our heat exchanger. Our heat exchanger empties out here. On the PVC side of the heat exchanger, we have our return line to the tank coming in here. Let me focus you guys coming in here, down into the heat exchanger, flowing counter to the hot water flow, and then back up and onward to the tank. From the heat exchanger, we go on and all around here. And down here, as you guys can tell, I recycled a fair number of fittings and pieces of copper pipe for this. Uh, otherwise it would have gotten a little bit more expensive than I wanted. We go to a, I'm sorry it's so dark in here, we go to a uh, copper union right here so that I can disconnect the entire system. And then a half inch shutoff valve and then back into the cold line, feed line, to our hot water heater. All right, so a trick if you need to keep a specific angle on a pipe and a fitting is to use a Sharpie and just draw a line right across the joint. That'll make sure that you keep the right angle between that joint after you dry fitted the pipes. All right, so I am not a plumber, but I thought I'd walk you guys through uh, just how I do uh, basic plumbing just so you don't have to if you've never done it before look up another YouTube video So I use uh, these auto pipe cutters and I slide them on my marked pipe And you just turn them in the direction that the arrows say to turn them Plenty of wrist action and it breaks off the pipe. Um, what you're left with is something that has a little bit of a ridge, so it's not going to want to fit into your fittings probably, and uh, it'll have a lip on the inside, and neither one of those things are good, so we want to remove those. Uh, you can get a deburring or reaming tool. I lost mine, so I am just using a regular old um, box cutter or exacto knife and cutting out the little lip on the inside. So then there is also 
a lip on the outside and you can remove it just by rubbing it on a sheet of sandpaper. Uh, I'm going to use an electronic belt sander just to do it quickly. Alright, then lastly you want to get a fresh untarnished surface on this copper, so uh, grab your uh, multi-tool and just insert the copper pipe and twist it. And this will remove any surface corrosion, leave you with a nice bright uh, copper finish that you can solder to. You want to do the same thing to your fitting. So make sure they're both clean and now we're going to solder this. So you're going to want to get some uh, flux, some definitely lead free flux on your uh, pipe and you don't want huge gobs, you just want a nice smear around. Uh, large gobs of soldering paste will actually cause you problems or soldering flux. And you want to do that to both the inside of your fitting and the pipe. Making sure there's no large gobs. Then just insert the pipe fittings together. Alright, so I've got my map gas torch or your propane torch and I've got my lead free solder and we want to use about a half an inch of solder for half inch joints and about three quarters of an inch of solder for three quarter inch joints. As a rule of thumb, you just don't want to be over soldering this. And what we're going to do is we're going to heat up the pipe. We don't want to heat up the solder with the flame itself, we want to heat up the pipe. And we're going to preheat the pipe a little bit, and then we're going to go in with our solder. Alright, so my flame was a little bit off, and I'm pretty bad at this. Uh, you saw that I accidentally uh, hit the solder with the flame and that's because my flame is uh, not adjusted properly so make sure your flame is adjusted properly but then you can wipe down any excess that you get over and uh, that's a solder joint you can see my solder joints are pretty ugly and uh, they still always hold water never had a leak yet cross my fingers uh, so that's how I solder. Like I said, I'm no expert, but that's about how you get it done. So the system is up and running. You can see that heater hot water 2-1 is on right now, and that is the hot water heater system. And we go over. You're not going to be able to hear anything because uh, the pump is dead silent to the point where you can't hear it at all, even if you stick your ear right next to it. Uh, but I've got the entire thing uh, soldered up and it is running right now. I've got a few small issues. It's a little bit hard to get the uh, seals on the heat exchanger to seal completely just with thread tape. And because you have full household pressure there. And so I'm getting a drip every minute. So I need to take it apart and retape the two ends of the heat exchanger but I've also uh, run insulation along the entire pipe to kind of improve the efficiency of the system 
because the uh, more insulated you have the system, the less heat you waste, and that's one of the main reasons to do this is to save on your heating bill. So everything's insulated up and it's running really well. So the pump is actually heating a little faster than I would like, and I think I'm going to try to throttle it back a little bit with uh, the return valve. And I'm using the return valve for this because pumps generally like back pressure better than they like being uh, throttled back on their intake. So I'm going to turn this, I don't know, maybe to half off, something around there. I'm going to see what that does to the rate at which my heater is heating my tank. The last step is to control this system. Now here I have the pump and the solenoid, or the uh, ball valve, and I've got those wired up. The ball valve I just attached a DC pigtail to and uh, plugged a 12 volt adapter into. So that 12 volt adapter and the circulating motor are both plugged in to this DIY temperature controller which is an STC1000 uh, temperature controller wired into a few plugs but you can use any off the shelf uh, system and a number of companies make these. So you're going to plug this temperature controller into another temperature controller because you need a backup for this system. The system is heating very quickly so you definitely want to make sure that if something goes wrong you have another system to catch it because you aren't going to have time to figure out there's a problem. So this temperature controller is plugged into my Apex which I'm using as the primary temperature controller and it's plugged in right there into my Apex. So let's go to the Apex and see how this is working. So this is the Apex Fusion display of that outlet and we can see that I have it set as a heater. I have the fallback to off and I have the on temperature to set to 78 degrees with a differential of 0.1 degrees meaning that the temperature turns off at 78.1 degrees. If we look at what that does to temperature, uh, this is a graph of the last two days of temperatures in my tank and we can see that the heater usually kicks on at 78 degrees or 77.9 degrees and it is usually uh, heats until we reach 78.4 degrees. So it's actually overheating the tank a little bit because that water has to circulate through. Don't worry about this section. This is my metal halide system which slightly overheats the tank right now because it's actually pretty warm here. Now if you remember I said that I was going to turn down that valve to try to reduce the speed at which the tank was heating and this is before the valve was turned down and we can see that the rate of heating is rather quick and this is after I turned down the valve halfway and we can see that it slowed down slightly it doesn't heat up quite as fast but it's not a huge difference I don't think you're going to be able to change the speed at which your tank heats up too significantly using the valves but I'm not sure that really matters because what we see here is that we only have a half a degree difference between our high and low temperatures which no organism in your tank is going to be able to feel and it is way less than the temperature change in most electronic heaters but it does mean that that backup temperature controller is very important this is a log of when the heater turns on and off and we can see that the heater turns on and stays on for 10 to 15 minutes each time and it stays off for about half an hour which is, I think is a really good amount of time. It's not turning on and off constantly so it's not stressing the pump um, but it's not continually running either. This is a graph of the amount of watts used by this system. This obviously does not include the gas used uh, by your hot water heater but when the system is off it's obviously using zero watts and when it turns on it's using about 26 watts, which that's 25 watts for the pump and a watt or two for the electronic ball valve. So that's it for heating your tank with your hot water heater. If you have any comments or suggestions, please put them down below. And as always, thanks for watching, guys.